The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Achieving State-of-the-Art Care in Bladder Cancer in an Era of Innovative Therapeutic Solutions. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash JKS860. So why are we here today? We're here today to try to describe the evolving landscape in urothelial cancer. It's very, very exciting to see the field evolving so, so fast, rapidly, I would say. And while we make all this amazing progress, there are still unmet needs that we try to address in our research, clinical trials, standardization research, so on and so forth. And of course, our educational needs. About only one third of our patients with non muscle invasive bladder cancer are given intravesical BCG. And that's important because we know intravesical BCG is one of the cornerstones of treatment, right? For BCG naive, non muscle invasive bladder cancer. And national BCG shortage is a big issue in the United States right now and can have an impact in access to care and patient outcomes. About half of the patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer worldwide, globally, may not receive curative intent therapy. Again, this is a big issue having to do with access to care, disparities, and of course, diversity inclusion. Patients may have undergone radical cystectomy for muscle invasive bladder cancer, but they may have impaired quality of life and high risk of recurrence. So how can we address those needs? And Dr. Gupta is going to tackle those questions and with very, very important questions to improve outcomes and quality of life of our patients. Dr. Schrader is going to address other important questions. For example, more than half of our patients may not go on to receive first-line therapy in advanced urothelial cancer. How can we improve upon that and the outcomes of our patients? And of course, clinical trials, that's a vehicle of success. That's how we move forward, right? So we want to make sure we accrue patients on trials across races, ethnicities, be inclusive, and we have to improve upon clinical trial enrollment. So Dr. Schrader will talk about the frontline therapy in advanced urothelial cancer. At the end of the talk, I will uh, take over from my colleagues and I will discuss the personalized treatment selection after cancer progression with new data, new targets, and new opportunities because many patients who have progression of the urothelial cancer after first and second line therapy may not receive subsequent therapies and we have to review the data. What are the novel agents that now can help us treat our patients and we have new agents for armamentarium, which I think are important to review. Just to give an overview of the evolving landscape in muscle vegetable bladder cancer, and metastatic disease, I will start by saying that non-muscle invasive bladder cancer is usually being managed by our colleagues in urologic oncology. And BCG, as I mentioned, intravesically given, is the cornerstone of therapy. Sometimes intravesical chemotherapy may be given. And patients who have BCG unresponsive carcinoma in situ, usually they go to radical cystectomy and lymph node dissection. But pembrolizumab, given intravenously, have an indication now it's FDA approved for BCG responsive carcinoma in situ for patients who are not fit for radical cystectomy or refuse to undergo this life-changing uh, uh, procedure. If you think about muscle invasive disease, there is, of course, level one evidence with cisplatin-based neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And over the last few decades, we have made improvements in the uptake and implementation of this level one evidence. Cisplatin-based neoadjuvant chemo with either dose and SEMVAC and growth factor or gemcerapine cisplatin. And patients may undergo uh, neoadjuvant chemo followed by radical cystectomy lymph node dissection. And now we have data with adjuvant evolumab, and we're going to cover this data today in the adjuvant setting. Bladder preservation is a big deal, and I know uh, Silva and myself are a part of the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network Organizing Committee, and we have a plan to discuss that in the next Beacon meeting in August in Denver, Colorado, about bladder preservation and how we select patients for maximum TURBT followed by chemo radiation. Very important consideration for select patients. In metastatic disease, we're going to discuss the recent developments, frontline and beyond. So very, very excited to see the new data in this field. Oncologists have a very important role in educating our patients on the importance of genomic testing. I think genomic testing has really, you know, has significant uptake, I would say, in the management of patients in advanced urothelial cancer. And I think it's important to try to make sure we, we do this genomic testing early on because it can reveal targets, for example, FGFR2 or FGFR3, activating mutation or fusion for erdafitinib, as well as other targets for possible clinical trials. And we're going to review tomorrow some data with anti HER2 antibody drug conjugates, which I think will be interesting data. So genomic testing is important for somatic tumor alterations, but also germline testing is important for some patients with family history, young onset of cancer, upper tract disease, because germline genetic mutations may have implications for the patient 
and the broader family for cascade testing and cancer prevention. And at that point, I want uh, to highlight again the importance of the Blood Cancer Advocacy Network. Kala, Silpa, and myself were part of that, and we're very proud of to being part of the Beacon team. It's an excellent resource for professionals, patients, and families and caregivers. Provides educational resources to help patients feel more prepared. And of course, provides funding for research in educational programs. And of course, we have a great clinical dash trial dashboard to illustrate the clinical trials that are available for our patients. So let's hear from patients over here about their experience with the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. You can see the video. I was uh, diagnosed with bladder cancer in March of uh, 2018. I'm often asked um, how much information I knew when I was diagnosed. And I have to say that I knew virtually nothing about bladder cancer. And I learned uh, very quickly after the diagnosis that I needed to become knowledgeable in what my cancer was, uh, was all about. And there are wonderful um, opportunities online to, um, to research that. Uh, BCAN or the uh, Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network is, is wonderful. Um, it's very easy to, uh, to understand. So I think it's best to prepare because it will make your consultation um, with your uh, bladder surgeon or your oncologist more meaningful. And preparation will um, assure you that you'll have a more comprehensive discussion about your situation. And so the way that, that I prepared was to know as much as I could, which in fact was still very limited, but also to kind of outline in my mind how I was going to participate in that consultation. Thanks to Alan for this very illustrative presentation. And again, this organization is from patients to patients, and I think it's really, really great to be part of that. So thanks, Beacon, for all you're doing. So there are multiple treatment options for patients with urothelial cancer spanning across the spectrum, right, from early disease stage with intravesical therapies. We talk about BCG, chemotherapy given intravesically, as well as patients who get treatment for muscle vasodilatory or metastatic disease. For example, chemotherapy, cisplatin-based, or other systemic chemotherapies, radiation, immune checkpoint inhibition, antibody drug conjugates, FGFR inhibitor, and bone targeting agents. And we're going to see some interesting data tomorrow. We're excited for the tomorrow's uh, bladder cancer day about PARP inhibitors in select patients based on biomarkers. The question is, is there a future role? There is no role right now, but is there a future role or not for PARP inhibition in this disease? So I will start us off with a case, and uh, we'll present this case for now, and then I will pick the brain. Uh, Silpa and Kala can help me deal with that particular case. This is a 58 year old gentleman who presents with hematuria. Hematuria is the most common presentation for bladder cancer. It's something that we make sure we, the patients get evaluation early on with urology to avoid delaying the diagnosis. We want early diagnosis. And good kidney function, creatinine clearance is more than 60 cc per minute, no significant comorbidities. A workup with cystoscopy, a TURBT, and CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis with intravenous contrast. So the sessile mass in the bladder, anterior side, and the TURBT showed mass invasive bladder cancer, and no metastasis, so it's a localized disease. So the question here is, how do we treat this patient? Neoadjuvant chemotherapy, cisplatin-based, followed by radical surgery, or bladder preservation. We can talk about that in the, in the next few slides. And obviously, we'll talk about standard of care options and clinical trial options, which I think is important. So with that case in mind, it's my honor and pleasure and joy to present to you Dr. Silpa Gupta. Dr. Gupta is an associate professor at the Department of Hematology and Oncology and director of the Genital Urinary Oncology Program at the Tausi Cancer Institute in Cleveland Clinic. I was there myself before, and I know Silpa has taken the program to a next level there. So Silpa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Petros. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for uh, your time to attend this program. I'll talk about the recent progress in early stage bladder cancer and implications for high risk non muscle invasive bladder cancer and muscle invasive bladder cancer, what we oncologists need to know. What is the evidence supporting immune checkpoint inhibitors in high grade BCG unresponsive NMIBC? We have the phase two Keynote 057, which was the pivotal study of pembrolizumab monotherapy. And in January 2020, FDA approved pembrolizumab for BCG unresponsive high-grade NMIBC in patients who are ineligible for cystectomy or have elected not to undergo cystectomy. 
And this was uh, based on the data that out of 96 patients with BCG unresponsive disease, 41% patients had a complete response at three months. And the median duration of response was around 16 months. And of the 39 responders, 18 remained in CR for 12 months or more, and 28% remained in CR at the time of data cutoff. There were no new safety signals. Of note, this approval is for the patient with the carcinoma in situ cohort. Phase two SWOG S1605 study is another uh, study in the similar patient population using atezolizumab monotherapy. And in the interim analysis, the primary endpoint for CR at six months was seen in 20 out of 74, that is 27% patients. And there was a, an unplanned secondary endpoint, which was CR at three months, and this was seen in 42% patients. This is not approved in this indication, but the results are uh, quite comparable. And in the updated data, it was shown that the response duration was more than six months CR in 20 patients with CIS plus minus TA or T1 disease. And the 12 month CR rate was 49%. Event free survival in 55 patients with T1 or T1 disease without CIS at 18 months, it was 47%, and there were no new safety signals. Again, as oncologists, we usually get these referrals from patients uh, for patients if patients have declined surgery or are too frail or have comorbidities uh, precluding surgery. Now, what are the updates in muscle invasive bladder cancer? We'll talk about bladder preservation and trimodality. As Dr. Grieber said, this is an unmet need. Not everybody needs surgery. And there are certain patients, when carefully selected, who will have good outcome with trimodality bladder preservation approach. So in this phase two trial of pembrolizumab and gemcitabine, plus concurrent hypofractionated uh, radiation therapy presented by Dr. Bellar uh, last year, they found that at a median follow-up of around 15 months for the efficacy cohort, the primary endpoint of estimated one-year bladder intact disease-free survival rate was 88% and complete response rate was 77% at 12-week post-radiation. The immune-related adverse events were manageable and were seen uh, in concurrence with data uh, previously available from various immunotherapies. And there are certain randomized trials now, like the Keynote 992, SWOG1806, and INSPIRE study, which will better define the role of immunotherapy in trimodality bladder preservation. There's been several uh, neoadjuvant trials which are uh, using a pragmatic approach of bladder preservation in carefully selected patients with DDR alterations because these patients, if they have uh, DDR alterations in their tumors and have a response to chemotherapy, it's estimated to be long-lasting and hence gives an opportunity for bladder preservation. The RETAIN trial was uh, based on the fact that if patients uh, were offered active surveillance or standard of care intravesical therapy and chemo radiation or surgery. This is a phase two trial set up for a primary endpoint of MFS at two years. And in the interim results that were presented last year, there was 50% rate of urothelial cancer recurrence and 11% rate of locally advanced or metastatic disease in the active surveillance group. And 89% in the active surveillance group, the patients retained their bladder. So these data need to be followed long term and uh, need to be better studied in randomized setting. In the Alliance trial, which is again a very novel biomarker-driven trial, patients receive gemcitabine cisplatin with or without cystectomy or chemoradiation, depending upon whether they have a clinical response to chemotherapy as seen on imaging and cystoscopy and also a TURBT at that time. And if patients have the alterations, they have the option to uh, retain their bladder. This is also a phase two study with primary endpoint of three-year event-free survival. And lastly, there's an HCRN GU16257 study where GEMSYS and nivolumab is being offered to patients with muscle-invasive bladder cancer with select genomic alterations. And the endpoints are the clinical complete response rate and ability of the clinical uh, complete response to predict benefit and association between the DDR panel. And in this case, the clinical complete response rate was 48%. And these are all early data and long-term follow-up will um, 
further validate this approach. There's been a lot of progress made in the intravesical delivery approaches. For example, TAR200 is an intravesical drug delivery system that enables a sustained release of gemcitabine into the bladder, increasing the dwell time of the local drug concentration and thus avoiding systemic effects. It's almost like a tube or a pretzel, so to speak. And in this phase one study of TAR200 in patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer who were unfit or refused curative intent therapy, it was found to be safe and well tolerated after four consecutive three week cycles. Overall response rate was 40% at three months and median overall survival was 20 months. 12 month progression free survival rate was 67.7% and duration of response was over a year. And this data is quite encouraging, especially because this is not an invasive procedure. Patients undergo intravesical treatments uh, often, so the urologists do this during that procedure. And now there are several combination trials using this agent and another checkpoint inhibitor, cetrilimab, and these trials are ongoing. For example, the phase 2B sunrise trial is a larger trial in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer where TAR200 and the cetrilimab are combined and checked against TAR200 alone versus cetrilimab alone. So it will be really a three-arm trial looking at each drug and the combination. Then there's the phase three sunrise two trial, which is a 550 patient trial in muscle invasive bladder cancer with TAR200 and cetrilimab versus concurrent chemo radiation. And the phase two sunrise four trial is a smaller trial in muscle invasive bladder cancer where they're looking at TAR200 plus cetrilimab versus cetrilimab alone. And this highlights and underscores the um, innovation that is going on in trying to better deliver drugs within the bladder. For neoadjuvant chemotherapy for muscle invasive bladder cancer, for patients who are eligible for cisplatin, this is the gold standard, although not utilized in majority of patients in this uh, important study led by Grossman and colleagues within the SWOG uh, uh, network in 2003, uh, published in NEGM, neoadjuvant uh, MVAC and cystectomy, they found that there were 90 deaths and median survival was 77 months. And in the surgery alone group, median survival was only 46 months. So there was a 2.6 year overall survival benefit. There have been certain new, uh, a lot of new adjuvant phase two trials with checkpoint inhibition plus chemotherapy. Blast one study was a trial I led with my colleagues uh, um, at uh, University of Utah, University of Minnesota, and Dana Farber, and we showed that in 41 patients who got gemsis and nivolumab, the PCR rate was 49 percent. There's been another trial using gemsis and pembrolizumab led by Dr. Holmes through the Hoosier Cancer Network where the PCR rate was 43%, and a recently reported GEMSIS uh, split dose plus pembrolizumab trial, the response rates were 39%, and in GEMSIS and atezolizumab trial, the responses were 41%. Now, this is uh, not to compare the uh, trials or do cross-trial comparison, but only to highlight the fact that combination of immunotherapy and chemotherapy is safe and potentially effective, and there's several phase three trials ongoing. We are presenting our follow-up uh, progression-free survival and biomarker analysis from the BLAST1 trial uh, at this meeting. Please feel free to check our poster. And these are the several uh, phase three trials which are now uh, ongoing in both cisplatin ineligible as well as cisplatin eligible MIBC patients. For example, in the cisplatin ineligible patients, the keynote uh, 905 trial is looking at pembrolizumab and enfortumab vedontin compared to pembrolizumab alone or radical cystectomy alone because uh, that is usually the standard for these patients. And patients who are receiving immunotherapy continue that after surgery as well. In the PIVOT trial, nivolumab and BEMPEG, uh, another novel immunotherapy agent, is being looked at. The S2011 trial is combining gemcarbo and evalumab in these patients and the Volga trial is looking at their value map, tremilumumab, and fortumab vedontin. So a lot of different novel agents using the immunotherapy backbone and a good partner with that. In cisplatin eligible trial, there's the Energize trial, 
which is comparing Gemsys versus Gemsys and nivolumab. Initially, there was an arm with IDO inhibitor, which has now been dropped. The Niagara trial is combining Gemsys with Dervalumab versus Gemsys alone. Keynote 886 is looking at pembrolizumab, similar uh, design. And the Keynote 815 is looking at uh, pembrolizumab and fortumavidontin. And again, uh, the patients who get immunotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting also continue uh, the immunotherapy and the partner in adjuvant setting. And there are several uh, trials in progress updates at this meeting, like the PIVOT and the Volga trial. Now, talking about adjuvant pan-FGFR inhibition in high-risk muscle-invasive bladder cancer, uh, there's a novel study called PROOF-302 study, which is uh, harnessing the fact that 21 to 38 percent of invasive, that is T2 or higher, upper tract urothelial cancer, harbors FGFR3 alterations. <coughs> Excuse me. And in these patients who are having alterations and who are not candidates for cisplatin in the adjuvant setting or refuse, can be randomized to ingrafitinib or placebo. And the primary endpoint is disease-free survival. Placebo is a reasonable option for patients who are not cisplatin eligible. And also nivolumab is not widely used in this setting, uh, given lack of enough data, even though it is approved. In the Pegasus trial, uh, patients who receive neoadjuvant cisplatin-based chemo or are ineligible for cisplatin undergo cystectomy, and if they have PT34 and or uh, node-positive disease and alterations, they receive another FGFR inhibitor called pemigritimnib. And both these trials are um, very novel, looking at targeted therapy approach. PARP inhibitors have uh, shown a revival in bladder cancer, and we will see more in this meeting. And Dr. Grievous here has led uh, the ATLAS trial in the past, which uh, didn't meet its clinical endpoint, but provided a lot of information on the biology. An antibody drug conjugate uh, in fortumavidontin, we are going to get the data from a cohort from EV103 for neoadjuvant in fortumavidontin monotherapy in cisplatin ineligible MIBC patients. Now looking at the adjuvant trials in muscle invasive bladder cancer with immunotherapy, it's really a, a very mixed result so far. If we look at the Invigor 010, which compared atezolizumab versus observation, primary endpoint was disease-free survival, secondary endpoint was overall survival, amongst other endpoints. This did not meet the primary endpoint and was a negative study, although we learned a lot of information about ctDNA and biomarkers. On the other hand, similar patient population, the Checkmate 274, which compared nivolumab versus placebo, met the primary endpoint of disease-free survival and was FDA approved last year in August. The ambassador trial, which uh, might turn out to be the tiebreaker, is comparing pembrolizumab versus observation and there are co-primary endpoints of disease-free survival and overall survival. The trial completed accrual, and uh, results are awaited in the coming years. This study shows uh, the Checkmate 274 disease-free survival uh, results in the placebo arm. It was 10.8 months in all comers, and in the nivolumab arm, it was 21 months. And in the PDL one 1% um, or higher uh, tumors, patients who harbored those, the results were even more pronounced with uh, disease-free survival not reached with nivolumab. However, the indication does not require pdl one testing. And with approximately five months or a longer follow-up, the disease-free survival was maintained in both these patient populations. The safety signals were nothing uh, new compared to what we already know from nivolumab across multiple settings. Uh, there were uh, grade uh, three or higher uh, adverse events were seen in 42% patients compared to 36% in placebo, and discontinuation occurred in 7% patients in nivolumab arm. want to highlight here this important resource with the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network about the clinical trials dashboard, which can help uh, match a patient to their individual needs, uh, because sometimes it is very uh, overwhelming to find the right trial, and this can help from a patient's perspective to find the right trial and seek a consultation there. 
And I'll uh, hand you back, Dr. Grievous. Thank you. Fantastic overview, Silpa. Thank you so much. You covered so much data eloquently, as always, in a very short time. So I'll need your help here. And I think, Kala, you are on call here. We, we call, <laughs> call a friend, phone a friend. So we'll, uh, we have this case again that I presented before. 58-year-old gentleman, hematuria, war capsule, bladder cancer, muscle invasive disease, a CAT scan, chest abdomen and pelvis, no metastasis. So localized muscle invasive disease, good kidney function, no medical comorbidities. The mass is in the anterior part of the bladder. Uh, you know, we don't have all the information here, but let's say this is a unifocal tumor. Let's say, you know, it's T2, no hydronephrosis, no variant histology. And let's say good bladder function. The patient has good bladder capacity. So how would you approach? Silva, I'll start with you here. Would you go with a standard neoadjuvant chemo followed by radical surgery, bladder preservation? What are your thoughts? I think in this, in this patient, uh, you know, looks like a younger patient with no comorbidities, eligible for cisplatin. I would go with the uh, radical cystectomy. I mean, that's an observation. Uh, that's an option. And also because it is a clinically localized uh, uh, mass, which is not extending out of the bladder, there's no mention of a hydronephrosis. Bladder preservation would be a reasonable approach as well. So we would want to offer multidisciplinary approach to this patient so patient can make an informed decision. Thank you, Silpa. Carla, any comments from you? Yeah, I mean, I would like to pick up on the multidisciplinary aspect of it. I think that's really the most important. For us, at least, we have our patients assessed by a radiation oncologist and a surgeon up front, and then they send the patient to me for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and I'd absolutely give this patient neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Then we send the patient back to the surgeon and the radiation oncologist for an opinion about what's the best way to proceed going forwards. And um, this patient would be a great candidate for bladder preservation if they want that, based on all the factors you said, unifocal. I would make sure that they don't have a lot of CIS because that tends to spread deep and uh, may not be ideal. But uh, yeah, no, I think this patient should be discussed in a multidisciplinary setting. I totally agree with both of you, and I think that's one of the key home, you know, messages, take home messages for our, our uh, colleagues here, that multidisciplinary tumor board, it's a key aspect of the management of those patients, having urological oncology, medical oncology, and radiation oncology, ideally pathology and radiology, review the images, the films, the pathology, and make an informed decision, as uh, Dr. Srida mentioned. If you think about bladder preservation, we look at, you know, patients who have usually smaller unifocal tumors, not extensive carcinoma in situ, I, I conventionally know hydronephrosis and no extensive vanity histology with good, good bladder function, and we you know give them the option. Um, if this patient goes for radical surgery, you know what chemotherapy regimen would you use, Silpa, if you go for new adjuvant chemo? I would uh, use Gemsys. Uh, you know, MVAC is the other option, but for the most part, uh, um, practice is to use Gemsys. And you give four cycles? Yes, four cycles. Do you give? More than four, in not patients who had like borderline not positive cases, would you stick with four or you do more? I still stick with four. Four? Yeah. Gotcha. Kala, what uh, neoadjuvant chemo would you give if the patient was to go for surgery? Yeah, I mean, I tend to go with Gemsys right now. I image at the beginning, I image after two cycles just to look for lack of progression, if we can think about it that way. I am intrigued though by the Vesper data and in someone who's young and fit, I may be inclined to think about something like dose dense MVAC, but it really hasn't been my practice to date. I've been more of a GEMSYS person. Thank you. So both Silpa and Kala go to GEMSYS. And Kala, you mentioned the VESPER trial that was presented at ESMO just a few months okay. ago, 2021. Okay. Do you want to briefly comment on the VESPER trial, the design and the results, briefly? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the authors of that trial really need to be congratulated because we've had this question for a long time. Do we do GEMSYS? Do we do, do, we do dose dense MVAC? You know, and it would seem that maybe dose dense MVAC has a little bit of an edge, but there were major toxicity concerns that we have to be aware of. So patient selection is really going to be the key. What I say is neoadjuvant chemotherapy is critical in patients who are candidates. And I don't think we should be splitting hairs between GEMSYS or dose dense MVAC as long as they get a cisplatin-based combination chemotherapy. Great point, Carla. Silp, any comments on the VESPER trial? I totally agree with uh, Dr. Sridhar that while MVAC did show slightly higher responses, toxicity was also of concern, and we are not really gaining much uh, from that. And the other difference in the VESPER trial was six cycles of dose dense MVAC mm -hmm. versus four mm -hmm. cycles of GEMC, so a little bit different numbers yeah. of cycles yeah. there. Absolutely. A bit confusing. And uh, in terms of clinical trials, uh, Silpan Kala, would you be interested in offering this patient a clinical trial? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I always think about what's standard and what's clinical trial, and I present the options to the patients. I mean, there's various trials now in this setting. Um, and, and I'm kind of encouraged that we're starting to see more and more trials in the bladder sparing setting, because typically most of the trials would mandate patients would get a radical cystectomy after their neoadjuvant treatment, which to me didn't always feel the most patient-friendly approach. I, I, I agree with you. It's uh, have to think about, you know, comprehensively about the patient. Silpa, any, mm -hmm. any clinical trials for bladder preservation or neoadjuvant chemo? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the whole idea of the multidisciplinary approach is to be able to offer them multiple options and they can make an informed, informed decision. Informed decision, yeah. And you mentioned very nicely, Silpa, there are eight clinical trials, yeah. neoadjuvant, adjuvant with checkpoint inhibitors, and a lot of checkpoint inhibitors in the neoadjuvant setting remains experimental. Uh, and I think these trials will give us the answers. There are four of them in statin eligible patients. And for bladder preservation, there's SWOG 1806, Chemo RT plus minus Atijo, and Kala, you are part of that. And uh, we have the Keynote 992 mm -hmm. with Chemo RT plus minus Pembro. And there is this INSPIRE trial that, uh, yeah. Silva, you mentioned, and this is for not positive disease, right? Right. Yeah, that's kind of pushing the envelope, you know, you're treating the not positive patients with a more uh, aggressive approach and using radiation in that. Although some people might just do systemic therapy given they are more advanced. Right, and the INSPIRE trial, ECOCAC 8185, Patients get induction chemotherapy first, three to six cycles, and then they get randomized to chemo radiation plus minus durvalumab. Is that yeah. the design? And for upper tract disease, I know we have all of us have an interest in this upper tract disease. There's a new adjuvant trial that we led through the ECOC Acrin with Zinni Hoffman Sensins and uh, Vitali Margulis. And this new upper tract disease, they get dose dense vac plus minus durvalumab. Uh, which is an ECOC Acrin 8192, building upon the ECOC Acrin 8141 with those then same VAC adjuvant. So we have to see whether there is a role for combination in the upper track space. And for those who are not fit for cisplatin, we give the palmab and cytamine. So that's a trial that we try to make sure we accrue as a, as a group here. So thank you so much, uh, Carla and Silpa. Great discussion. So we're going to move on to the next part of the talk. So uh, I have another case for you. We are going to present it now, and then I will let Kala present her important uh, part of the presentation, and then we'll come back to the case. So this is a, another patient who had hematuria, bladder mass was diagnosed, uh, TGRBT confirmed histological urothelial cancer, and uh, sadly, the patient had metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis with significant pelvic and retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy. This patient has an ECOG performance status of two, Creatinine clearance was below 30 cc per minute. Patient is an active smoker despite canceling to quit. Diabetic patients, hypertensive with mild anemia. There is no autoimmune disease, no use of steroids, and has a low PDL1 uh, CPS of 1 uh, based on the Agilent uh, DACO 2 3 assay. And tumor next generation sequencing was sent to look for genomic alterations for FGFR as well as other alterations. So we'll come back to this case in, in a bit, but uh, in the meantime, again, it's my pleasure and joy to uh, announce and uh, uh, present Dr. Carla Streeter. Uh, Dr. Streeter is a medical oncologist and the GU site lead at Princess Margaret Cancer Center in uh, Canada. She's a professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto, and she's the chair of the GU Medical Oncology here in Canada, Toronto. Uh, Kala, thank you for joining, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Petros. I'm really excited to be here with you and Shopa to discuss the exciting new advances in the field of urothelial cancer. I'm going to start by showing this treatment landscape, which many of you are familiar with. Um, some of the key points here, you'll notice that platinum-based chemotherapy first came into the field around the year 2000, and it remains a standard first-line treatment for most patients today. As we move along the time bar, we can see that the immune checkpoint inhibitors came along around 2016 and 2017 or so, really in the platinum refractory setting. And I think this was really, really critical to our field because this then opened the door for future clinical trials. It showed that trials could be done that we could that ultimately lead to drug approval. So I think this was a really, really important turning point in our disease. As we look forwards, we can see that the antibody drug conjugates like infortumab vidotin and sasituzumab govitekin have shown efficacy in advanced stage, heavily pretreated patients, um, ultimately leading to their approvals. We saw the first targeted therapy, which is erdafitinib, which targets the FGFR pathway. Um, and finally, we've seen the use of the immune checkpoint inhibitors 
in the maintenance setting, so in patients who are responding up front to chemotherapy as a way of maintaining that response. So I think it's been really, really exciting to see all these new developments. A few caveats to keep in mind, two of the immune checkpoint inhibitors, atezolizumab and dervalumab, were withdrawn for the platinum refractory indication. And for patients who are not eligible for receiving either cisplatin or carboplatin, the label has changed for pembrolizumab to allow for it to be used in that setting. But it's very restricted to only patients who can't get cisplatin or can't get carboplatin. So just a few points to keep in mind. So let's take a closer look at the current status of first-line treatment in metastatic urothelial cancer. So for patients who are cisplatin eligible, we look to either gemcitabine and cisplatin or dose-dense-MVAC, and we follow that up with avelumab in patients who don't have disease progression on the frontline chemotherapy. For patients who are cisplatin ineligible, we often will use gemcitabine and carboplatin and again use maintenance of avelumab, and all of these are category one recommendations. For patients who are platinum ineligible, as I mentioned, either atezolizumab or pembrolizumab, the two immune checkpoint inhibitors, um, have been evaluated in this setting and have shown some activity. Three key points I want to raise here. First off, I think the cisplatin eligibility criteria are changing. We've typically used the Golsky criteria that sets a creatinine clearance of 60 and above. However, in this patient population who tend to be elderly, sometimes have comorbidities, Using this criteria will exclude a large number of patients. So many of us in the field, I think Shilpa has done some work on this, um, are using a creatinine clearance of 50 and above to allow us to use cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And part of the reason for this is that we know that gem cis is superior to gem carbo. And then finally, although there's been a lot of excitement about the immune checkpoint inhibitors, when we look just purely at objective response rates, we know that they fall below what we see with both GEMSYS and GEMCARBO, and likely explains why the use of these drugs is restricted to patients who can't get either GEMSYS or GEMCARBO. So we know that chemotherapy works in this disease. We know that immunotherapy works in, in this disease. What about combining these? What does that tell us, and, and how does that look? Well, we've had two trials that are very similar, both in VIGOR 130 and Keynote 361, as I've shown here. And these have basically taken the immune checkpoint inhibitor and given it by itself, so atezolizumab or pembrolizumab, respectively. Another arm of this trial combines the immune checkpoint inhibitor with platinum-based chemotherapy, and this was compared with the standard of care, which is platinum-based chemotherapy. Interestingly, both of these studies were felt to be negative studies. Um, and I think that, that made us pause and think about things a little bit more as to why maybe these don't work so well together and given at the same time, are they antagonistic perhaps? So I thought a, a lot of um, unanswered questions um, as far as why these trials didn't work. A few points to note in the combination arms in both of these studies, the atezo or the pembrolizumab were allowed to be continued until disease progression. And the subtle point to make here is this was in all patients, so not specifically those who did not progress on frontline, but really all patients had a bit of a maintenance component incorporated. Secondly, we know the monotherapy, atezo, and pembrolizumab arms were halted by the FDA after the pdl one low group actually showed decreased survival. So I think it's an important warning to us that we do need to do these trials. We do need to make sure that these drugs are helping patients um, to live longer and not simply adopt them without these important trials to guide us. Another important combination trial looked at combining a PDL1 inhibitor, duralimab, with a CTLA4 inhibitor called tremolumab. And you see the three arms of the trial here, Durva, Durva plus tremi, compared to platinum-based chemotherapy. And this study had co-primary endpoints, overall survival in the intent to treat population, so the whole population, and they were looking at dervalumab plus tremolumab versus chemotherapy. The hazard ratio there was 0.85. Also looked at the overall survival in the pdl one high population, comparing dervalumab against chemotherapy. The hazard ratio there was 0.89. So this was also declared a negative study. It was an interesting secondary endpoint, however, that looked at overall survival in the pdl one I group comparing D plus T versus chemotherapy. So the combined immune checkpoint inhibitors 
versus chemotherapy, and there we saw the hazard ratio was 0.74. So perhaps there's something going on in the combination arm that warrants further study. We also have the Checkmate 901 study, and this study is not yet reported. This also looks at that concept of combining a CTLA-4 inhibitor and a PD-1 inhibitor, so ipilimumab plus nivolumab, combining nivolumab with chemotherapy and comparing against the standard platinum-based chemotherapy. Co-primary endpoints here, PFS and overall survival in the cisplatin ineligible group, and as I mentioned, we're waiting for these results. So this study is actually a little bit more complex um, where the randomization is based on cisplatin eligibility. The primary endpoint is based on the cisplatin ineligible population who are randomized to either ipinevo or standard chemotherapy. So we'll have to wait and see what the results of this study will show us. So despite success in other tumor types with this chemotherapy combination approach, phase three studies of the immune checkpoint inhibitors in combination with first-line chemotherapy and advanced urothelial cancer have not really shown significant improvements in overall survival. So what about thinking about a sequencing approach instead? So here we see the Javelin Bladder 100 study, which I'm sure all of you have heard about already. This is a switch maintenance strategy after first-line chemotherapy. So I'll just walk you through this study design. So this took patients with unresectable, locally advanced, or metastatic urothelial cancer they'd all received four to six cycles of platinum-based chemotherapy, and that could have been gem cis or gem carbo. And they had to have had stable disease, partial response, or a complete response. These patients were randomized to either avalumab, given 10 milligrams per kilogram every two weeks, plus best supportive care, or best supportive care alone. The treatment-free interval, which is the time from the end of chemotherapy to the beginning of either avalumab or best supportive care, was four to 10 weeks. Key stratification factors was the type of response, whether they had stable disease or a partial response or complete response, and whether they had visceral or non-visceral disease. The primary endpoint of this study was overall survival. Here we see the overall survival results. On the left is the ITT population, and on the right is the pdl one population. And what you can see is that the maintenance of LMA plus best supportive care showed a statistically significant survival benefit in both arms. Overall survival and PFS benefits were seen regardless of pdl one status, regardless of whether patients received gem cis or gem carbo, regardless of the number of cycles, whether they had four, five, or six, regardless of the response to chemotherapy or the duration of the treatment-free interval. Ongoing analyses are um, taking place, looking at long-term outcomes of these patients, what subsequent treatments they had. There's a number of um, studies that we'll hear about in the years to come. Avalumab, based on this study, was FDA approved for switch maintenance treatment um, of locally advanced or metastatic urothelial cancer that had not progressed following first-line platinum-based chemotherapy. And this is really an important study, I think, because often after the chemotherapy, we would just be waiting. And this actually gives us an option, and I think patients feel comfortable that they're doing something. So this is a, an important study from that point of view. So we have a number of ongoing challenges. So one relates to what's the ideal biomarker. Effective biomarkers, we know, can characterize and identify novel therapeutic targets. Variable data has been, have been reported regarding the predictive utility of candidate biomarkers such as pd one expression, tumor mutation burden, and other gene expression signatures. None of the established biomarkers assessed in the Javelin Bladder 100 study, either alone or in combination, optimally predicted overall survival benefit with avalumab. So neither pd one positivity on tumor cells or immune cells alone fully predicted the overall survival benefit, as you can see in the curves there on the left. Multiple other biomarkers were identified as potentially predictive, and there's a lot of research going on to understand gene expression signatures, which may be associated with various immune cell types, including both innate and adaptive effector cells. So we have a few ongoing questions. First, what about patients who don't have a disease response to first-line platinum-based chemotherapy? What about patients who have disease progression on avalumab? And what other maintenance strategies have been explored? 
So as we look ahead, we're going to see some other maintenance strategies that are being explored. The Atlantis trial is looking at the PARP inhibitor Rucoparib in the post-chemotherapy setting. And similarly, the MEET Euro 12 trial is going to be looking at another PARP inhibitor called Neroparib. So I think it'll be interesting to see the results of these studies as they are presented. So what we know is in the first-line setting, platinum-based chemotherapy is a preferred option for patients with metastatic urothelial cancer if they are eligible. The switched maintenance strategy is ideal because we know that the immune checkpoint inhibitors sometimes take some time to work. So if you're waiting for a patient to finish first-line treatment and then have disease progression, you may lose the window to treat with an immune checkpoint inhibitor. But what about patients who are not platinum eligible? You can look to monotherapy with atezolizumab or pembrolizumab, as I mentioned earlier. But I think where the future is going is really the combination approaches. Antibody drug conjugates plus immune checkpoint inhibitors or PARP inhibitors plus immune checkpoint inhibitors. This is a particularly exciting trial. It's called the EV103 trial. And this combined the antibody drug conjugate and fortimab vedotin with pembrolizumab in locally advanced or metastatic urothelial carcinoma. Uh, we saw response rates of about 73%, which is now approaching the response rates we see with chemotherapy. Uh, median progression-free survival of about 12.3 months. Um, a phase three study called EV302 is now underway, comparing EV plus pembro to chemotherapy in the frontline setting. And I think we'll all be anxiously watching the results of that study. This is the phase two Bayou study, looking at a combination of the immune checkpoint inhibitor Durvalumab with Olaparib. Um, the primary endpoint on this study is progression-free survival, and a number of important secondary endpoints are also incorporated. So in conclusion, I think it's actually a very exciting time in the field with several new drugs with differing mechanisms of action. Outcomes are improving even in advanced stage disease, and I think this is great news for our patients. With more treatment options, both sequencing studies and a better understanding of biomarkers, I think will become increasingly important. Clinical trials remain the key to continue our forward momentum. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Carla. Fantastic presentation, so much data and exciting data. So thank you so much for doing such a great job. I'll go back to the case that we have here so I can ask for your help. So, Kala and Silpa, so this patient has metastatic disease, a diagnosis, lymph node-only disease, no visceral disease, ECOG PS of 2, creatinine clearance below 30 ml per minute, no autoimmune disease, not using steroids, PD-1 is low, it's only CPS1, and the genomic testing is pending. I will start with you, Silpa, I know you have done some very nice work. Actually, three years ago at ASCO GU, you saw the nice poster looking at the platinum ineligible population. Any comments about that and how will you treat that patient? Yeah, thank you, Petros, and um, <clears throat> you're part of that collaboration. In this survey, we uh, found that from 60 providers who treat bladder cancer primarily, uh, what would their threshold be for not giving carboplatin because it's an undefined category? And creatinine clearance of 30 is uh, uh, the cutoff equal performance status three or higher, and that's you know a proposal for consensus definition for which we are now updating uh, uh, and hopefully can uh, discuss it as co. In this case, uh, given the creatinine clearances less than 30, I would, and other comorbidities, I would offer single agent uh, uh, pembrolizumab or atezolizumab for platinum E eligibility. Regardless of PDL1 expression? Yes, we don't need to check for PDL1. Uh, frankly, I've moved away from it and don't use it in any setting. Got it, got it. Kala, what's your take on this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to think about why the creatinine clearance is uh, is low. So we've done some work also published looking at how can you how can you improve the creatinine clearance? Is it a question of hydration? You know, I, do we need to get nephro nephrology involved? So I think that's one of the things because it's really going to impact on our treatment choice going forwards. For us here, unfortunately, we don't have the option of frontline immunotherapy outside of a clinical trial. So I would look for a trial if there's something available. Um, the other thing I sometimes have done is single agent gemcitabine. So I might do that for a cycle or two. And sometimes that's all it takes to just get you a little bit of response 
sometimes renal function actually improves. So it's always tricky in these situations where you don't, maybe you want to give an immunotherapy, but you can't. Um, that's usually what we do. Thanks, Carla. And actually, you made a great point that the access checkpoint inhibitors may differ from country to country, right? And this brings the point of access to therapy across different parts of the world, you know, globally. So the question I have for both of you, how much do you delve into the creatinine clearance? Do you uh, just uh, rely on serum creatinine? Do you ever do 24-hour urine creatinine uh, collection, 24-hour urine collection, uh, Kala? Yeah, I mean, sometimes I will, right? It'll really depend on how badly I want to give the platinum. Um, I will try to establish if this is a true value or not. I will recheck it. Sometimes even, you know, a patient has not been eating or drinking or what have you, you might see some bumps up in the, in the creatinine clearance. But we really need to be cautious because we're making such significant treatment decisions based on this. 24-hour um, urine is, a, is actually not a bad way to, to verify if it's true or not. And Silpa, nephrostomid tubes in metastatic disease? Yeah, you know, if it's, uh, like uh, Carla said, if it's a fixable uh, problem, we should try to do that and then offer carboplatin followed by Velumab maintenance if appropriate. So um, certainly that's a good idea if, if we can do that. So tomorrow we're going to see a couple of studies in this population of patients. One is the LIT-11 trial. Dr. Lorio will discuss uh, pembrolizumab plus lenvatinib versus pembro placebo phase three trial. It's an oral presentation. We're excited to see the data there. And then we have the Bayou trial that uh, Kala, you mentioned with Durval Laparib. Uh, any comments uh, you know, about those designs and uh, how do you believe it, what the data will show? Yeah, I mean, I think that anytime you're, you're treating with something that is not requiring a great <laughs> kidney function, I think that might put us ahead. I mean, so that's why I'm sort of excited about something like Derva plus Olaparib. Um, both of them, you know, it just speaks to this issue of being able to give patients these treatments. Um, similarly, something like EV, Pembro, I think you've got a broader range of patients that you can potentially give these treatments to. So I think those are definitely treatments to watch going forward. And Silpa, I have a question for you here. I see a question coming up in the iPad. So is there any patients that you would not give a Velumab maintenance uh, in, for any region after response to stable disease to platinum-based chemo? No, based on level one evidence, we should be offering it to patients, but you know, uh, the Q2 week is not feasible and practical for everybody. Uh, so in that situation, uh, if patients really can't make it, then that's the only scenario um, where I don't, um, do it and monitor them closely. I agree with you. And in my practice, every patient who has response to stable disease is being offered a Velma maintenance because of the data that Kala mentioned, level one evidence of a survival benefit. And tomorrow we're going to see longer follow-up, Kala, as we pointed out. Tom Pauls will show data with longer follow-up with a higher proportion of patients getting subsequent therapy. And it will be interesting to see the hazard ratio, uh, how, how it lands, right, in that study. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other point is that, um, which I think is it's relevant, you know, if patients have active autoimmune disease on steroids, that may be a potential exclusion, but otherwise, I, I do the same thing with you, Sulp, I give everybody a Velumab. Kala, a question for you. What about the, the, the benefit with a Velumab maintenance? Does it matter if you get cis or carbo in the induction chemophase? And also, what about four, five, or six cycles? Yeah, so, I mean, I think the data from Javelin is particularly strong because multiple subgroups benefit. So we've seen benefit regardless of the type of upfront, whether they have gem cis or gem carbo, like you said, whether they have four, five, or six cycles, um, whether they have a CR, PR, or stable disease. And we also even looked at the treatment-free interval, which on the study was four to 10 weeks from the end of chemo to the beginning of Avelumab. Um, and in chunks of four, two, sort of four to six weeks, six to eight weeks, and eight to 10 weeks, it didn't make a difference overall as to how long um, you waited within that four to 10 week period. So that is sort of, again, it's, it's patient-centered in the sense that if they finish chemotherapy and they want a little bit of a break, I think they can safely take the break before starting a Velumab. Thank you, Carla, great point. So Silpa, it definitely we all agree here that level one evidence is there for a Velumab maintenance. And you are leading a phase three trial now, building upon that, the main CAF trial. Any quick comment on that design? Yeah, sure, uh, Petros, and I know uh, both you and Carla are going to champion that uh, within your cooperative groups. So we are leading this phase three trial, which is further trying to build on a value map maintenance, because as you know, a value map doesn't benefit everybody and we need to intensify that. So we're gonna compare 
a value map to a value map in cabozantinib uh, for two years, and uh, we hypothesized further overall survival improvement if the combination was successful. Interesting trial, and now Kala and myself and others are very excited. So uh, we're going to move forward. Uh, thank you so much, both of you. And I'm uh, going to take over. I, I have a, uh, a big shoes to fill here after Kala and Silpa's great talks. Uh, we'll talk about personalized therapy selection and new data, new targets, and new comp opportunities. I think it's exciting to see that, uh, the, the field evolving here. So before I give, give the case here, I want just to point out there are several ongoing first-line trials. Silva mentioned the main calf trial. We also have the Checkmate Nano 1 that Kala mentioned. The Nile trial, which is interesting, is chemotherapy, chemo plus durvalumab, and chemo plus durvalumab tremelimumab. Uh, and this trial is still ongoing. And we also have the EV302 with Pembro EV combination, which looks very promising in the phase 1B trial, versus chemotherapy. And those trials are ongoing, so we'll have to see what they show in the future. Having said that, what about the second line and beyond setting, right? How do we treat patients after uh, first-line therapy? So this gentleman, 69-year-old, symptomatic progression with fatigue and back pain after four cycles of Carbogem was not fit for cisplatin. I agree with Carla that I tried to give cisplatin in cisplatin-fit patients. This patient was not fit for cisplatin, got Carbogem, and on restaging scans uh, had liver and bone metastasis. Eco PS was still one, still hanging there, uh, 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 functional. The next generation sequencing showed actually an activating mutation in FGFR3. It's a very typical mutation, S249C, it's activating mutation. This patient has no concomitant visual issues, skin, nail, or GI issues, no autoimmune disease. Uh, albumin is slightly low, uh, hemoglobin is slightly more than 10. Uh, this patient is obese with uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, 9.2%, grade one neuropathy. Uh, so we'll revisit this case in a, in a second, um, and uh, we'll discuss about options. So survival rates are low for patients with metastatic urothelial cancer after progression of platinum-based chemotherapy. And actually, uh, tomorrow there is an interesting uh, poster that Dr. McCracky is he's sitting here in the back. He's presenting some data looking at this time on the first-line treatment and how that time is associated with response to checkpoint inhibitor given the second line. So it will be interesting poster uh, to look tomorrow to see if there is any uh, uh, association there between the time of first line treatment to the subsequent checkpoint inhibition. Uh, and as uh, we mentioned before, we have checkpoint inhibitors uh, approved already in the platinum refractory disease. Pembrolizumab has level one evidence based on the Keynote 045 trial. This was a phase three trial comparing Pembro to either Taxane, single agent, or Vinflunin. This was published by Dr. Belmont and colleagues in the General Medicine, 2017, and showed the significant overall survival benefit with uh, pembrolizumab in the platinum refractory second-line setting. And this gave level one evidence uh, in, for this checkpoint inhibitor. Nivo and Avelumab are also approved in this setting based on phase two trials. And obviously, we're very excited for uh, immune checkpoint inhibition, but also for novel agents, antibody drug conjugates and fortmavedotin, antibody drug conjugate against nectin-4, and satisfusional covitican, antibody drug conjugate against drop-2, and of course, a dafitinib FGF receptor inhibitor. And uh, just a couple of words about FGFR mutations and fusions, that we uh, see them quite frequently in, in, in muscle based bladder cancer, it's about 20% of patients have an FGFR3 mutation or fusion, and this may be a driver uh, in the cancer pathogenesis. So it's important to do genomic sequencing, as we mentioned before, somatic tumor testing to pick up those alterations for potential use of herdafitinib down the road. And uh, we see these alterations across the spectrum of uh, stages of bladder cancer. And there is a number of FGFR inhibitors being tested. And dafitinib is the only one with an accelerated FDA approval. We'll uh, talk about the data in a second. Uh, and, the, and the study that led to this accelerated approval was the BLC 2001 trial. Uh, these are patients with selection based on the genomic sequencing, have FGFR2 or FGFR3, activating mutation or fusion, and they have platinum-based chemotherapy. So platinum refractory population, second and beyond, and erdafitinib showed a response rate of 40% in that trial that I just talked about. Erdafitinib on the eight milligrams once a day uh, dosing. Uh, this study took about 100 patients and they had central testing for FGFR. Uh, overall response rate was a primary endpoint. And as you see here in this swimmer's plot, you see some durable responses. Overall response rate was 40%, 4% CR, 36% PR. And the median duration of response was about six months and about a third of the um, patients reached a response that lasted more than a year. And the benefit, as Dr. Lorio showed uh, in his manuscript in New England of Medicine three years ago, 
the uh, benefit, the response rate and, and benefit has seen across different uh, subsets of patients. Uh, this was a single arm phase two study. There was not a randomized trial. And the, there is a phase three trial uh, called Thor that is going to actually compare uh, erdafitinib to pembrolizumab in the platinum refractory setting, as well as erdafitinib with uh, salvage chemotherapy like bifidine or taxane in platinum refractory disease. We also have seen data in the frontline setting by Dr. Pauls. I think this was ESMO uh, 2021. This was cisplatin ineligible patients, so frontline setting. Their FGFR uh, testing was done. And these patients were randomized in a small phase two study, erdafitinib alone, or erdafitinib plus a trelimab, an anti uh, 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 one agent, uh, one agent. And this is a checkpoint inhibitor in combination with FGFR inhibition. And this particular study, as you see here, is a small sample size. You see 18 and 19 patients respectively. So take the data with a grain of salt. You have a response rate that is almost double with the combination, raising the hypothesis that if you combine an FGR inhibitor with Cetrelium at a checkpoint inhibitor, you may actually improve upon response rate. And that's, I think, it's interesting data. It's not practice changing, but definitely supporting further evaluation of FGFR inhibition plus checkpoint inhibition in cisplatin ineligible patients in the frontline setting. Again, this is not practice changing, but definitely support further evaluation. And I mentioned before the third phase uh, uh, three trial, uh, this is platinum refractory disease, patient selection based on FGFR3 or two mutation or fusion, and patients get randomized to erdafitinib versus chemotherapy or erdafitinib versus pembrolizumab. Try to select what is the best second line therapy in patients with a biomarker positive, do you check on inhibition or erdafitinib? And going forward here, in addition to uh, erdafitinib, which is an FGFR inhibitor, we have these very, very exciting agents as well, then Fortmovedotin and Satsuzumacovitican. These are antibody drug conjugates, but very different compared to each other. So on the left side, then Fortmovedotin, it's an antibody drug conjugate against Nectin-4. This is an adhesion molecule in the membrane of urothelial cancer cells. There is a link here that links this antibody with a payload, and monomethyl or statin E, MMAE, that's a microtubule inhibitor that actually um, is a very, very potent cytotoxic drug. And um, the second molecule, such as Susan that a drug has a different molecule, different structure. The antibody is targets TROP2, very different than Nectin-4. There's a different linker and different payload, SN38, which is an active metabolite of Rinotican, a toposomerase 1 inhibitor. So as you see from this slide, these molecules are very different from each other. So I think it's important to keep that in mind as we see the data, and I think there is room for both of them in the treatment of patients as we go through. So EV201 study, this was a phase two trial with enfortumavidotin, this antibody drug conjugate against Nectin-4. This was uh, a study with two cohorts. The cohort one was third line and beyond, so patients who had prior platinum chemotherapy and checkpoint inhibitor, they enrolled uh, to get in Fort Mavedot in single agent uh, at 1.25 milligrams per kilogram, uh, given on days 1, 8, and 15 on a 28-day cycle. Cohort 2 was second line after first line checkpoint inhibitor. So patients may have received Pembro or Atizo front line, and they get in Fort Mavedot in second line without platinum chemo. These are just platinum ineligible uh, patients. So the cohort one led to the accelerated approval of uh, and form of adotin. This was, I think, in December 2019. And you see here the overall response rate was impressive, 44%, with 12% complete response rate and 32% partial response rate. And if you see on the right part of this curve, you see in the waterfall plot, 84% of patients had reduction in the tumor size. So very impressive data. Just for context here, will, uh, the taxane single agent has the response rate, and Dr. Schitter had done, done studies on that, you know, between, I would say, 12 and 18 percent. So this is uh, definitely uh, higher than historical controls and led to the accelerated approval of Enfortumab in December 2019 in this previous population with prior chemotherapy, prior checkpoint inhibitor. Cohort 2, also very interesting, impressive data. This is single arm, again, Enfortumab adotin after checkpoint inhibition, 89 patients. And this uh, was published by Dr. Yu and Dr. Balar and colleagues in Lancet Oncology a few months ago. The response rate confirmed was 52%, as you see. Uh, very impressive, more than half of the patients responded. 20% complete response rate, 31% partial response, uh, and if some patients had stable disease, and with a median follow-up more than a year. And based on this data, the FDA gave actually approval of Enfortumab adotin as second-line therapy 
in patients who are not fit for cisplatin, cisplatin ineligible patients after a prior line of therapy. So patients may have received checkpoint inhibitor front line, or you can argue carbogem, and, and Fordmob is an option for those patients. Second line. So the EV301 was a phase three trial, tried to confirm the results from the cohort one of the phase two EV201 trial that I just showed you. So this is a phase three trial and Fordmovedotin versus chemotherapy, toxitaxel or paclitaxel in the US, or Vinflin in Europe. And the primary point was overall survival. These are patients after prior plant chemotherapy, after immunotherapy, so third line and beyond. This trial showed overall survival benefit with enfortumavedotin, as you see, has a risk 0.70, 30% uh, reduction in the risk of uh, uh, death uh, with enfortumavedotin versus uh, salvage chemotherapy. And there was also uh, a significant progression for survival benefit. Uh, you see 5.6 versus 3.7 months median PFS has a risk 0.62. And the response rate, it was 44% in the phase two, is 41% in the phase three trial versus 18% with uh, single agent taxane or vinflurin. No new safety signals compared to the phase two study. And uh, uh, obviously it's very important when we look at the efficacy data, look at toxicity data for all those agents, right? Erdafitinib and Fortmob, Cytosumab, checkpoint inhibitors, chemotherapy. And uh, adverse events of interest there, skin reactions, peripheral neuropathy, hyperglycemia, generally were mild to moderate and consistent with previously reported adverse events in the phase two trial. And I think it's important to read you know, the manuscripts for those published studies. Uh, this was an important paper by Dr. Powell's in the New England of Medicine published last year. Moving along to Asacetuzumab covitican, another antibody drug conjugate. This drug is different. I mentioned this different structure. And trophic user one has multiple cohorts, actually has five cohorts right now. It keeps evolving. Cohort one was the one that showed, uh, that led to the accelerated approval of this compound. I will call it SG for brevity in the uh, uh, platinum refractory immunotherapy refractory population. The drug is given at the dose of 10 milligram per kilogram, days one and eight, on a 21 day cycle, single agent, uh, cohort one. Cohort two is still ongoing, is actually cytosomacovitic and single agent after checkpoint inhibitor. So it reminds us of the cohort two of the V201 trial that I just showed you. So cohort one, as I mentioned, this was published by Dr. Tagawa, myself and other colleagues at the JCO about a year ago. And you see here the response rate was 27%. I want to point out here that many of those patients had multiple prior therapies. So the range of prior therapies was between one and I think eight or nine. So very heavily pretreated population of patients. So um, uh, multiple prior therapies, 27% response rate with a 5% CR and 22% PR and 77% of patients had reduction in the tumor size. So very um, high proportion of patients with benefit like and Fortumab as well. And you see here in the swimmer's plot, a median duration of response about seven months, median PFS, about five months, median OS about 11 months. I always caution this is a single arm phase two study, so I will take PFS and OS data with a grain of salt, which is not a randomized trial. Uh, grade three, uh, higher atrial led adverse events, neutropenia, diarrhea, uh, was about 10% of abdominal neutropenia and 10% uh, grade three or four diarrhea. And the Tropic 04 trial, there's a trial in progress that we have a poster uh, tomorrow. This is a phase three trial. This is very similar to EV301 that I showed you. This is SG at the dose that's approved, 10 mg per kg, days one and eight on 21 day cycle, versus taxane single agent in the US or Vinflin in Europe. And the overall survival is the primary endpoint. The phase three trial is ongoing, uh, it's accruing, uh, and we're uh, targeting to have about uh, 482 patients across different centers and countries. So we look forward to these results in the future. And I want to also highlight the interest and I would say enthusiasm with other antibody drug conjugates in addition to enfortumab and sacituzumab, and you see tacituzumab doristecan. This is an antibody drug conjugate against HER2. I think HER2 is relevant in urothelial cancer. Uh, I have done my PhD looking at HER family in colorectal cancer, different disease type, but they're interesting to see the data in, in urothelial cancer. So keep that in mind. Uh, and again, HER2 uh, can be expressed in urothelial cancer cells. So back to the case here. So 69 year old gentleman, four cycles of carbogem. So Callan uh, Silpa will call on you. So liver and bone mets, ECOG PS1, activating mutation uh, on FGFR3, no immune disease, no GI issues, no uh, visual issues, hemoglobin slightly more than 10, grade one neuropathy, uh, obese patient, hemoglobin is a little bit high. Silpa, what would you do here? So this patient progressed on platinum, so uh, immunotherapy is a very uh, reasonable option, like you mentioned, based on the keynote uh, 045, so I would offer pembrolizumab.
to the patient and monitor closely for um, side effects like we usually do. And adafitinib is also an option based on the uh, mutation. Um, however, the patient has poorly controlled diabetes, which leads to retinopathy, and you know, adafitinib has a major side effect of central serous retinopathy, so I would not want to risk that at this point unless absolutely needed. What about the infortumab in that case? In that? I think another, um, infortumab is also an option, and I was going to reserve that for later, given the patient already has grade 1 neuropathy, and infortumab can make it worse. So I would start with pembrolizumab, get the diabetes under control, and then we have to be able to offer multiple treatments during the patient's uh, journey with this disease, and we just have to choose wisely what to use when. But I foresee this patient would need all three therapies in some sequence. Yeah, and the, the big question you raised, Silpa, is the sequence of therapies. We don't know exactly the sequence. So, Kala, assuming you have all the options available, again, in, a, in an ideal world, uh, you have, you know, Pembro, Erda, and Fortumab, uh, or a trial, what would you do? Yeah, so I'm a trialist at heart, so I'll always look for a trial. Um, assuming that I don't have an appropriate trial, I tend to agree with Shilpa that I may go to pembrolizumab as my next choice. There's a few caveats here. So one of the reasons for that is we are somewhat sequence dependent in our drug approvals. So for example, infortumab is approved in the post-platinum, post-immune checkpoint setting. So giving the checkpoint inhibitor in the second line setting opens a door for the use of infortumab in the third line setting. The other caveat is there's some data on either side suggesting that patients with FGFR 2-3 alterations may, may or may not respond as well to something like pembrolizumab. So that's something to keep in mind. And that would then speak to the fact that we follow these patients quite closely, as Shilpa had, had mentioned as well. And then beyond the pembrolizumab, let's say we do that in the second line setting, I think your two options would be something like either, uh, you know, infortumab, or in this case, you could think of or defitinib. But it's really about trying to maximize getting, the, pa getting the, the treatments into patients because you really don't know what's going to work, right? So you want to keep all options ahead of you on the table. And at each treatment point, I will reevaluate if there's a clinical trial for which the patient may be a candidate. Great discussion. I, both of you raised great points. So let me ask you a little bit more looking here at questions in the iPad. So regarding the toxicity you know, profile of different agents here, as well as the site of metastasis, right? Liver meds, you know, usually immunotherapy, you know, um, can benefit patients, but liver meds are, are tarred, right, and, and bone meds. Um, how do the patient comorbidities and the site of metastasis help you think about selection of treatment in this yeah. setting? I think infortumabidontin has exceptional activity in the liver, so that's really, um, a, a, you know, preferred option of a pembrolizumab, I agree. Uh, uh, if we can closely monitor the patient, given the glycosylated hemoglobin is 9.2, and diabetic ketoacidosis can be a toxicity when and for them. I think it, it all boils down to uh, aggressive uh, management and preemptive uh, uh, watching of the patient so they don't uh, get into trouble with the toxicities while trying to control the disease. But I totally agree the chances of pembrolizumab working are uh, probably not that great, but if we have to use that, I would scan quickly after two cycles and move to infortumab. Given what Kala said, the ideal indication is for prior IO and prior platinum. That's a, that's a great discussion. So Kala, are you doing genomic sequencing in all patients with metastatic disease? When do you send the genomic testing? Right, so we are trying to do genomic testing. We have programs in the house that allow that to happen. I'm trying to get that done as early as possible because these patients can progress quickly. So you don't have a lot of time to wait um, to, get that, to get the testing results back. So that will help you to know what you can do standard and potentially trial eligibility comes into play. So we try to get the testing done as soon as possible. I think we're moving you know, across the field of oncology uh, to a setting where we are trying to get the testing done to understand a little bit more. I agree, and I, I sent the patient you know, for genomic uh, testing of the, of the tumor, as soon as I see metastatic disease, to have the results available down the road. I think it's a great point. Mm -hmm. uh, I will, um, I will change the question very quickly here, very quick comment. So how excited about you are about the HER2 uh, data? And we'll see more data tomorrow, of course, but would it be something that you think down the road you will you know, potentially use that uh, if, if the data look good? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Petros. We know HER2 is overexpressed in some bladder cancers, but 
I think in the past, the HER2 targeted therapies have not worked, and I know you've, worked, you've been involved in that work because we didn't know if that is the driver mutation, even though it may be present. But these novel uh, HER2 targeting agents like the antibody drug conjugates do look promising, and having another targeted therapy would certainly be great. We just need more data to see. Absolutely. Carla, any comments on the clinical trials on HER2? Yeah, I mean, I think it's exciting, and I think it's exciting because it's a potentially a different mechanism of action. And I think that's an important point to keep in mind, especially when we think about toxicities. And the point I was going to bring up earlier was, I think when we think about these toxicities with EV or with erdifitinib, it's important to bring in our subspecialty um, expertise. Like, you might need to bring in ophthalmology, you might need to bring in dermatology. Um, I think we're sort of training everyone around us um, in, in giving these drugs. So I think that was just a point I wanted to make from earlier. But I think it's exciting to see new targets. And what, what would be really interesting to do are, are trials looking at sort of doing biopsy on progression to really understand what are the patterns of resistance when we treat with one drug, what, what's happening? You know, what are the molecular changes? And as we have now more drugs in our armamentarium, can we now start to look at what's the personalized sequence for a given patient? That's a great point. I, I think you raised very important questions about understanding the mechanism of resistance, right? And how can we learn from circulating tumor DNA, biopsy right. of patient at resistance, and inform future trials. Great point, Kala and Silpa. I'll take, hopefully, just no more than two minutes to go through some safety considerations, and then I will try to leave at least 10 minutes for discussion, which uh, and some interesting questions I'm getting in the iPad. So there is a spectrum of immune-related adverse events, and I want to raise attention here Every patient who gets checkpoint inhibition, they need to be informed of early or late onset of adverse events, immunotherapy-related adverse events, that can happen in any organ, right? GI, pulmonary, dermatologic, endocrine. And it's important to have these educational materials if the patient gets an adverse event and lands in the emergency room in the middle of nowhere. They know that they alert the provider, I'm getting immunotherapy. Think about immunotherapy adverse events in the differential diagnosis. And obviously, there are guidelines from ASCO and CCN, CT, ESMO, and these guidelines are important. So we cannot review all of the guidelines in detail today, but I want to urge you to review those guidelines, maybe print them out you know, in your clinic, have them available when you have a patient with a mural adverse event in the, I know Cleveland Clinic, and I know Carla, you're doing similar things in that University of Washington. We have actually an email listserv, and we actually can reach out to an expert, non-oncology expert, pulmonologist, for example, if we have an, a case that needs immediate attention, and of course, we can get the patients, see the special right away. Edafitinib, we talked about that drug before. Uh, Carla, you made great points. Hyperphosphatemia uh, is something we have to keep an eye on, nutritionist, is important you know, for a low phosphorus diet, phosphate binders may be needed. Ophthalmologist, it's hard to get an ophthalmologist these days, right? So, to see ophthalmologist or optometrist, but it's required. You have to see them at baseline and then a monthly for the first four months, every three months thereafter. So we establish those relationships with ophthalmologist, dermatology for hand foot syndrome or, or nail changes. So it's important to build this team as much as possible and you know, in community oncology is also important and sometimes it's hard to have access to those specialties. And form of adotin, peripheral neuropathy, hyperglycemia, skin rash, uh, it's something it's an anticipated on target toxicity, and it's very variable, I would say, skin rash, different uh, forms. Usually it's mild to moderate, but you have to keep an eye also for some rare uh, severe skin reactions like Stephen Johnson. Keep an eye on that. It's mostly it's, uh, mild to moderate, though, and managed with topical steroids. Such uh, so as and neutropenia and diarrhea are one of the most common. Uh, growth factor support can help those patients uh, reduce the chance of viral neutropenia or dose reduction and diarrhea with education, hydration, and anti diarrhea medications and best supported care. And of course, I think Alan Silva made the point effective communication about multidisciplinary team members. It's very important to have this you know, open channels of communication, right? And learn from the experience from each other, collect data, and have non oncologists help our patients as well. So please take a moment again to fill out the polling questions you know, regarding the adverse event management. It's important to review the guidelines and you know, see how we can incorporate those guidelines and look at the package insert of each agent in order to inform your practice, educate the patients, the nurses, the advanced practice providers, and the physicians how to treat those patients. So we'll go with the Q&A. I think hopefully we'll have a few more minutes here to discuss. So I'll take the questions as they come in. So Silpa, very, very quick answer so we can cover many questions. So uh, I have mentioned EV302, right? EV Pembro versus chemo, very exciting trial. Any concerns that until recently there was no maintenance uh, available in the chemotherapy control? 
Would that throw off the results? Any comments on the, for the EV302? It probably will, but that's the problem with all trials when the standard of care gets outdated. But we have that trial open and we are able to offer maintenance of Valumab. It's allowed in the protocol now. Um, so um, I don't foresee any big concerns. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Carla, the next question for you. So that's a challenging localized bladder cancer, multifocal bladder cancer, high grade, papillary morphology, but variant histology, right? Bladder cancer, multifocal and variant histology. Muscle invasive disease with hydronephrosis, so T3, and plasma cytoid features, that's a variant histology. No metastasis, 72-year-old patient. How would you do? How, what would you do? Yeah, it's, it's a tricky thing, and I think that variant histology has been largely left out of many trials. Big, big unmet need there. Um, in any situation with variant histology where I'm concerned that a patient won't get good response to upfront chemotherapy, I will suggest to my surgeons that they take them to the OR front um, first, um, and then I would think about giving adjuvant treatment later. I don't want to lose the window for surgery. So that's usually how I, how I approach that. I mean, I think there's some nuances in terms of the actual type of variant. Some may be more or less sensitive to chemotherapy, and I'll use that in my decision making. Great points. Uh, Silpa, comments on that? I think at this point, like Kala said, you know, most of the trials have left this out, so we really don't know. But in our experience, for plasma cytoid, we are still offering chemotherapy. But I quickly scan them after a couple of cycles, and if there's any slight evidence of not uh, responding or progression, take for surgery. It's a very challenging variant, I agree with both of you, and we have a clinical trial at the University of Washington. We're actually evaluating dose dense and vac plus pembro combination in this variant histology, and so we're collecting biospecimens, you know, to do TURBT and cystectomy evaluation. So it's, it's very tough, and uh, hopefully we can have more um, results in the future from that trial. So um, we talk a little bit about uh, bladder preservation, and uh, uh, Silva will ask you, uh, so the question here is, uh, when you think about bladder preservation, you know, is that something that you think about a definitive approach, or all for salvage surgery down the road? How do you talk to the patients about that? I think we, uh, they can be a need for salvage surgery, but you know, because we're carefully selecting these patients, uh, we don't foresee that they would definitely need it. Uh, you know, we, I don't think uh, we are there yet where we are discussing with every patient because even today, majority of patients are being offered surgery, and I think we need to do a better job at multidisciplinary care. Unlike Canada, where color practices uh, in the U.S., I don't think every patient gets that option. It's a, it's a very important point, and I know, Kala, you're doing great work with bladder preservation there. The, Kala, the question I'm getting here is, well, how do you see the future you know, in the new adjuvant setting, right? Silpa saw these important phase three trials and you did a great work with the BLAST-1 phase two trial, Silpa. Do you foresee checkpoint inhibitors, Kala, alone, combined with antibody drug conjugates? How do you, you have a crystal ball? Sure, so I think if we put everything we have together, the strongest data right now looks at the combination of something like EV plus Pembro. I think the highest response rates we've seen with the added benefit of the tolerability that there's not dependent on a, you know, a, a perfect kidney function, if you will. So I'd be very excited to look at EV plus Pembro in the neoadjuvant setting, followed by potentially a bladder sparing approach. I mean, that might give the patient sort of the best of both worlds. I mean, of course, I don't know what the future holds, but I think that would be a super exciting approach. And then maybe post bladder sparing an adjuvant immunotherapy type approach. We have a trial going on in Canada that's addressing precisely that question of, of adjuvant IO. You know, if we draw from the Checkmate 274 that took a surgical approach, perhaps adjuvant IO would have a benefit as well in the post concurrent chemo rad situation. But for me, that's maybe what I see looking forwards into the crystal ball. But many combinations are, are being evaluated and, and I think the future is very bright in this disease. That's actually very, very interesting. Thanks, Kala, for setting your, you know, your vision for the future. So, Silpa, the question I have for you here, you talk about this uh, TAR-200, the intravesical gemphatamine the pretzel. You talk about the Sunrise trials. Do you see the future that this compound may be incorporated in the clinical practice? And, and yeah, which setting? I think it's really, uh, you know, based on the technology and the fact that... Uh, if you're doing uh, uh, intravesical gemcitabine, you have to do it weekly, but this uh, stays in the system for over 11 days or so. I think this is the next uh, big thing in terms of uh, 
technological advancement for drug delivery. And uh, I do think there won't be any barriers from urologists in incorporating it because they're still doing the procedure for this. It's interesting, very interesting to see this technology being implemented. Carla, the next question is for you. So you have a patient who actually had platinum-based chemo, went on to shoot metanas avelima based on the data you showed, javelin platinum 100. What do you think are the treatment options after progression to avelumab? Are the same with patients who had progression on upfront checkpoint inhibitor? Would you ever go back to chemo, or would you offer adiboid drug conjugate or dafidinib? How would you approach that? Right. So if you if you have a patient who's had platinum, then had maintenance of elumab, my go-to right now tends to be something like infortimab vidotin. I mean, in part, it's because it doesn't require any biomarker testing, which maybe in our Canadian environment takes longer, and these patients don't have a lot of time to wait. So that's that's what I tend to go to next. And then beyond that, if I have the trial, for example, the trophy trial, I may go to SG. I think they're different drugs, um, non cross-reactive in terms of toxicity and even response. So that's where I would think to go to after that. Um, but, you know, I have gone back and cycled back to chemotherapy. I have some patients who are fifth, sixth line, and I might throw a taxane at them once I've exhausted other things. I mean, it really comes down to their performance status and their desire. You know, do they want to try something more? You know, you know, it's a really, really important discussion to have with patients. But I really don't throw any of the options out. I think looking ahead, one of the questions will be, as these immune checkpoint inhibitors are being used in the non-muscle invasive setting, can we use them again in late, later stages of the disease? And now, you know, we have all these options, right? We didn't have them before, you know. Yeah. And Fortumab, Satsutuzumab, Berdafidinib, it's actually changing the, the landscape completely. Silva, you're getting the last question here. So... It's about the Checkmate 274 trial. So if a patient's never received neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we don't know if it's starting fit or unfit, you can answer both. Would you offer adjuvant nivolumab and in which patient if they never got neoadjuvant chemo? Yeah, so it depends, uh, uh, you know, if adjuvantly those patients can get cisplatin, and, you know, then we would. But for the most part, when patients don't get neoadjuvant cisplatin, it's because they're not eligible for it. So those, uh, if they have significant residual disease as per the study criteria, I would offer nivolumab, yes. So if a patient, uh, let's say, a patient is fit for cisplatin, but never was never offered neoadjuvant chemo, and has a T3 or, you know, let's say T3 disease post-surgery, would you give adjuvant chemo or nivo? I would give adjuvant gemsis. Kala, what would you do? Yeah, I would completely agree. I would give adjuvant gemsis. Um, in that setting. I think platinum still has a really significant role to play in this disease. And uh, I, tend, I don't want to throw out the things that we've used for a long time just when a new kid comes on the block. Um, I like the concept of giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy, then the patient has surgery, and then potentially going to nivolumab. We don't have approval yet in Canada, but um, I like that sort of approach. That's a great point. I agree with you completely. And we always push for neoadjuvant stand-based chemotherapy. If someone has residual disease T2 or higher after neoadjuvant chemo, meets the criteria for nivolumab and the checkmate to 74, unless, of course, there's any autoimmune condition. But I think it's important to follow the, the trial criteria, checkmate to 74, that then it's an option for our patients in the US, as you said, Kala. So I have to tell you, I'm so excited. You know, I learned so much from you, Silpa, Kala, uh, always. Uh, great pleasure. Thank you, both of you. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash JKS860. This activity is supported through independent educational grants from AstraZeneca, Bristol Myers Squibb, and Janssen Biotech Incorporated, administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs, LLC.